So thank you, Jenny, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Thank you for being here on the heat wave. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so yes, I am Julieta Arancio. I am a postdoctoral researcher. I'm currently affiliated to Drexel University in the US, to the Center of Science, Technology, and Society. And I'm currently doing most of my field work here in the UK, but at the University of Bath, at the Department of Physics. Uh, yeah, I'm funded by Sloan Foundation. So today, um, I would like to talk about um, what I've been working with for the last, I don't know, during my PhD and now during the postdoc. So yeah, since 2017 or something like that, um, which is about open science hardware. I've been working with the open science hardware community, the gathering for open science hardware uh, since then, trying first with a more exploratory approach, trying to understand movement building, how people came together, how people so different came together towards the same goal and which strategies they put into make this work happen. Um, and now I'm more into um, how open science hardware looks within academic settings. But today I think there are three main messages I would like to convey, which is, which are the implications for research of having hard, of working with hardware the way we work today, mostly? How can we harness open hardware for science for to, towards the paradigm for of strengthening research capacity in a different way than what people have been doing up to now? And finally, how can policy support open science hardware? So all those ideals and all, all that potential that we always mention, we can, we can see some of it happening. So um, I put this here because um, most of you are into hardware, so uh, I, I don't know, you probably know what open hardware is, but hardware also beyond science, it's, it's becoming more complex. And it's not only about gaining complexity because chips are getting smaller and smaller, or software has a, a lot of, um, is, is intertwined with hardware in a different way. But because um, there is like a tendency to, as users, lose a lot of control over our hardware. And I put two, two pieces of news there, one from the BBC, which is a, an issue that has been discussed quite like um, in, in a very agitated way in lots of forums. Like, I don't know if you knew that BMW is selling a car. You can buy the car, which is actually hardware. But if you want to get the functions of the heated seat and something else, then you have a subscription model, which is weird, right? Because we don't think of hardware. We don't think of cars that way. We think of cars as I pay for it. I get it. And the other one is uh, a piece from the New York Times that says, Yes, like you can make your tech survive obsolescence. So you can hack your way through uh, obsolescence as it as it is by design through some uh, the tricks that we will we will show you. So it's all about how we as users have less and less control over over our technology, and can we do anything about it or not? So. Science hardware in this trend is no exception, and I really want to apologize for the quality of that of that image. I know it's a little pixelated, but it, uh, it, it is what I had in that paper. Um, these examples are taken from the field of digital pathology, which is something that evolved from um, before the 80s. That's something that was like very straightforward: a microscope, a glass slide, a diagnosis, someone, a doctor looking at it and saying yes this is positive, no, this is not, towards very, very complex systems that are used today and that have other features that are really interesting, but in the way, we lose some of this control we used to have. So um, on your left, is, um, it's an image of all the layers of this WSI systems, which are whole slide imaging scanning systems. Basically what they do is they translate the sample that you have in the glass slide into an image, and that image, can, you can, I mean, is data, so you can do whatever you want with it. And besides doing the typical diagnosis, you can also use it to train algorithms and have automated detection, things like that. So this whole evolution, what, what it does is that we have more and more separation between what we see as users and the underlying technology and the underlying hardware. So you see all the different layers of technology that we have between us and what's going on in there. Um, 
So what is interesting is that we, if we think of hardware as infrastructure, um, specifically as research infrastructure, it behaves as infrastructure tends to behave, which is it's invisible until you have problems with it. Um, how, why do I say hardware, uh, hardware infrastructure is, is invisible? Well, if you think of research equipment, we don't think of it that much. We have um, an item in our budget, in our grant for research equipment. We have um, someone new who comes to the lab and you train this person how to use the equipment. We don't question that much what happens with the equipment. It's something, it's what we call a black box, right? So we give something to the equipment, we get data out of it. What happens inside, most of the time, we don't care. And the, the thing is that, again, if, if we think of hardware's infrastructure and we say that it, it's only visible when it becomes problematic, the thing is that it's already problematic for research in many, many situations. So I think the most obvious situation in which hardware is problematic is that it's reinforcing inequity in knowledge production. So um, for, for me, the, the closest case is that I, I'm Argentinian. I have uh, studied in Argentina my, my whole um, university degree, PhD, everything. Uh, my background is in environmental science, and I used to, I mean, I had to uh, work on a thesis. And my thesis was about monitoring heavy metal pollution in sediments in an urban river where it's a very populated area. And I had to, as part of that, I had to develop a network for monitoring it, which was very simple, right? It was uh, like a core sampler to get the sediments and then send them to the lab. And there was one core sampler <laughs> in the whole university, and I, if I had to wait for it, I would have waited for like two years to, to get that core sampler, of course, because I was a, an undergraduate student, so I was like the last of the last of the last. And if you think of it, a core sampler is a very simple device, mechanical device, it just takes a core, and ensures that you, you are on a bridge and you can take it up and you get your sample properly. Um, so I was so annoyed and I, I had a boyfriend at the time who was very handy and we decided to make our own and it worked. <laughs> so, so that was like, I didn't know open hardware existed there, but I learned about many, many people who were doing the same because it was just, you cannot wait that much, right? Um, things like this are more complicated as your hardware is more complicated than a simpler like mechanic core sampler. Um, and, it, and it's very uh, it's very clear when when you see not only the differences in the the number of publications that people in the global south are producing versus the number of publications people are producing in the global north, but also the kind of research that people can produce with instruments that are designed elsewhere. Right. So there are many um, uh, many different um, context factors that are not taken into account into design if the instrument I have to use is designed absolutely elsewhere, right? So hardware, proprietary hardware, black, sport, black box hardware has this problem of we are not accessing the designs, but also the design, uh, the manufacturing is concentrated. And this is always reinforcing this existing inequities in, in knowledge production. Um, Obsolescence, I think we are all familiar with, with this. <laughs> Things are, are designed to break and break down. But especially when design is and manufacturing is concentrated and you are in a country far away where you don't have any access to technical support, you don't have an access to spare parts, or you have access but it's really difficult, the costs are prohibitive, it's really an odyssey to get something repaired. And that's why you have WHO's uh, publishing reports saying that 70% of equipment in Africa is obsolete, right? It could be repaired. It's too expensive to do it. So they're just piling up there. And finally, even in well-funded institutions like this, for example, there is the problem of lock-in. So the problem of vendor dependence is a huge risk for labs, right? Uh, especially when you're so specialized and so niche that you're working with one vendor or two, and what happens if vendors go out of business? Or what happens is, like Microsoft did with CERN, suddenly they want to raise the price. You know? So that, that, is a, that is a real uh, real problem that we are not, I mean, I, I haven't seen much until open hardware um, of it being addressed, honestly. What is interesting, related to this last one, is that 
back in 1976, so this is old, um, there, is, there was a, a paper from Eric von Hippel, which is kind of the father of um, user innovation, user-led innovation concepts, that says that uh, they, they analyzed with the team a couple of innovations on scientific instruments. And they found out that 80% of the innovations that the scientists found out useful, found, found that they, they were useful for the work, were in fact invented and prototyped and tested first by scientists. Because as users, they know what they need. And then the role of uh, manufacturers is about improving performance, improving um, usability, like make, improving engineering, right? Like making it a product that you can buy. But the invention, the, the, the idea, it was a product of uh, the users, which makes a lot of sense because scientists are users that, uh, who have needs that change a lot, right? If you're always trying to look for new stuff, you will need an experimental setting that allows you to do that. <clears throat> and this, this makes us, I mean, uh, this brings me back to one of the first, like the, the first idea I wanted to transmit today, and it's that even, be, even if uh, supply chains were great, and uh, even if we all had access to, I don't know, distributed manufacturing of, of instruments, not being able to access your equipment, not being able to play with your equipment and prototype new things affects your research. Um, it has relevant implications because for me, from what I've seen, it's, it's similar to when you write, right? When, when you write and when you write complex stuff, you use your writing for thinking, right? You are using your writing for putting your ideas down and you read it and you put it again and you kind of prototype your writing. You are all, all the time re-editing and, and with instruments, the instruments are what allow you to see what you want to see and we have multiple examples in history on how different instruments have allowed us to see different things. Um, if we cannot do that, if we, if we can't exercise that freedom of really trying to work with our instruments to see new things, we may be locking in not only the labs, but the minds, right? We may be locking in the, the ideas, the knowledge that we can produce. So the key thing here is can we think differently about science hardware? Is there any other way to get out of the system, and I think you all know here that uh, there is an alternative paradigm. And um, the first time I came across this paradigm was when Jenny, uh, she mentioned the 2017 GOSH meeting. Um, and I, don't, I don't think I have to explain, but it, just for the recording I will say it, but Open Science Howard people, what they are proposing is to uh, a paradigm where the designs for the tools that we use for science are open, are shared publicly under open licenses, um, legal instruments that um, the Open Source Hardware Association, for example, has, has created in the past. So building on top of those, that community work, proposing a new and an alternative way of thinking of instruments um, in which we can all not only access, but study and, and understand what's, what's happening with our instruments. And not only that, but uh, produce them and commercialize them, enabled by distributed manufacturing and digital manufacturing tools. So this paradigm, what is interesting for me is, um, is that a very, it, it's a very interesting uh, approach to research capacity strengthening. Uh, this is what my research is about, right? So um, I, I look at this from a social science view. And what I see is that, what, first of all, why are people doing this? And people around the world uh, have, have this, even if they are in very different contexts, they share this kind of self-determination motivation. Huh? I want to gain control over my technology. I want to, because I cannot access it, because I cannot repair it, or because I want to change it and I can't. So it, it's, it's that motivation, even if it differs along um, in different contexts, there is that root of, I want to be able to do stuff the technology is not allowing me to. But it has the potential of, um, and I say the potential because <laughs> we are not there yet, um, of enabling a more equitable landscape of knowledge production, um, a, more, a vision of a distributed system where people can produce tools closer to where they use them, therefore they become more useful, and they can repair them, they can customize it, and especially you can learn about them, going back to what I said before, they can start thinking differently of 
uh, research questions. So just as an example, this is the case I'm, uh, I'm studying in the postdoc. Uh, it was one of the cases of my PhD, and now I'm going deeper into it uh, at the development team um, in, at Bath. So this is the open flexure microscope. Um, that map there shows countries where the microscope was built. It's a fully <coughs> 3D printed plus uh, optics um, components. Um, so, so it's a microscope that is research grade. There are many, many, many open microscopes around. If you just Google, you will find many designs. The interesting uh, feature about this one is that you can use it, as I, as I always mention because I, I find it very interesting, uh, you can use it for publishing in Nature if you want to, right? And you can use it also for clinical diagnosis. So there, there is, you can use it for complex stuff that needs proper instruments, right? Which is something that uh, I always get asked about, like how, how good are these instruments? Um, one, of, one of the most interesting things about um, this microscope is that it has been replicated almost everywhere. <laughs> right? It has been replicated in many, many places around the world. And not only by uh, people similar to the people who developed it, who is a team of physicists at Bath. So you have one design, and in fact, many, many designs that evolved uh, since 2016 because it was first developed here in Cambridge. Um, but then you have people who add fluorescence modules. You have people who add um, interfaces who are, uh, which are better for, uh, for example, a screen, which it didn't have at the very beginning, or software for make it improving usability. Um, you have other people that use it um, for education. So they are interested in having many, many, like a volume of 300 microscopes so all students of digital pathology can learn in a, in a better in a better way than having one very very expensive machine so what what is cool about this microscope for me is that it's acting as a platform um, because one of the most interesting things of open hardware is that if it's well done it's designed in a modular way so if it's designed in a modular way people can reappropriate what they need and then add a module easily on what they are needing so I think this is a good example of how open science hardware can become an enabler of multiple research avenues that we are not aware of. So the, the last idea here was that open hardware can refer to a lot of things, can refer to the device, the, device, the microscope is an open hardware device. It can also refer to a collective of people, like the gathering of open science hardware is an open hardware community. Um, and it also refers to the practice, the practice of designing something or downloading a design, changing it, and, and then sharing that through a repository, um, setting up a forum for exchanges. So it, it's, it's more than tech. So it's also the collaborative practice of forming a community of practice around it and exchanging lessons, kind of what the 3D printing um, movement started. But it's also about tech. Um, because I, I often find that this, this distinction between, oh, it's not, it's not the hardware, it's the collaborative practice. Yes, but it's also better tech. And, and I think that's important to, to, to highlight. It's technology that is allowing people to see things differently and exchange lessons with other people. And in that coexistence, in that, in that two way, two, two directions, we are creating knowledge. So the question here for me is, if it's so good, why isn't it a thing already, right? Like, why don't we have it already, like, by default? And um, this is part of what I've been doing um, in the postdoc, trying to understand why, particularly in academic settings, it's so hard for open science hardware to just be out there, if it has so many benefits. So some of the challenges I found is, um, are that, I would say I would group them in those four categories. First is a binary mindset um, that comes up all the time in conversations, not only with technology transfer offices, which are the, the university administration body that governs how you rule what you invent, uh, or how you, how, you, how you publish, how you transfer your invention to the world, but also 
within scientists, right? So there is this binary mindset between something is either patentable or is not patentable. And that's it. So you invented something, and if it's valuable, we're going to try to patent it as soon as we can. And if it's not, we're going to try to patent it anyway, and then we will have the technology transfer office either reject us or see how if we, we can find another way. And if it doesn't fit there, it goes into a drawer, and that's it. Um, and that is quite complicated because if it was only a policy of the technology transfer office, it would be easier. But it's because it's a mindset, it's embedded in um, a supervisor telling the PhD student, as soon as something, as soon as there is an invention or there, there is a change, let's try to patent this. Because with a good will, right? You, you have been through that and that helped you in your career progression. You want to help your PhD student do the same. However, there, are, there, there is the problem that in most universities, patents are really, really expensive, so they won't, well, they won't just patent everything. And if you, what, you, what you're inventing is non-patentable, then they will tell you most of the time, it's not patentable now, just maybe keep it, keep it maybe just in case if you, if you do something else later, you, you will be able to patent it. So in both ways, we are reinforcing secrecy. And that invention gets there. And when the postdoc or the PhD is gone, that's gone. The other one is disciplinary silos. So we are, uh, what I found is talking to people on open hardware, the, those people who do best are people who are in interdisciplinary environments. Neuroscience, biomedical research, um, disciplines in which playing with instrumentation is something accepted and normal and it's fine. And other disciplines such as physics, sorry, uh, such as physics, if you are doing that, you're doing engineering. And that's, why are you doing that? That's not novel enough. That's not science-y enough. That's, uh, what are you contributing to, right? Um, there's a clear problem with incentives, as I mentioned, like for career progression, it's either publications or patents, and <laughs> there is nothing else there that, well, funding maybe, but not, not anything else. Uh, and of course, our universities say that impact and outreach is, is necessary and important, but it doesn't weigh as much. And finally, credibility, because these devices, most of the time, they look like toys. And um, especially this one, this is a big thing for, for the open flexure microscope, which is, again, uh, it's a research grade instrument, but it looks like a toy because it's 3D printed. So people do not think it's that good. They think, mm, I don't know, are you really sure that it doesn't look serious? So you see funny things like, okay, what if we print it in white and green, like medical colors, you know? You start seeing this kind of strategies to try, try to um, give credibility to, to the instrument. So, how can policy enable more open hardware out there? Um, that image is from the UNESCO 2021 recommendation on open science. It was a big effort. It was a consultation, I think, worldwide, in which UNESCO said, okay, we have to have like a, not a standard, like a unified definition of open science, because there are so many different understandings. Um, and they came up with this, which is pretty interesting because if you see, they have open scientific knowledge and open hardware is there for the very first time in an open science policy. That never happened before, uh, which is a great milestone for a movement that was born in 2016. That, that's a very short time. Um, but it's not in open science infrastructures, <laughs> weirdly enough. So um, it's, it's interesting how to, how to connect this. Um, I asked why, and, and they said, it was very difficult to decide where to put it. So within this, uh, within this policy, this is like, a, like a, the principles, right? And then this will go to governments, and governments hopefully will uh, implement policies according to that, those principles. The thing is, open hardware is quite new. So there's a lot we know about open data, open access to publications, open educational resources. There's a lot of work on that, and it's much easier to formulate a policy. Um, we don't know that much about open hardware, so which are the policies? Uh, so, so some of the things uh, we've been working on with different people in the GOSH community are, can we think of a hardware commons? Can we think of um, a repository like you have for open data, or like a repository like, like you have for open access to the publications you work on while you are at university for hardware designs? Um, that wouldn't cost much in terms of infrastructure because repositories are already there, and 
would enable um, other people to access what we are doing in terms of designs. The other part of it is um, all the equity, the, the, the try, trying to understand hardware as part of research strengthening efforts. And here, I think it's uh, some, some idea we've been discussing and I saw in some of the documents um, from, from earlier workshops in, in African countries, thinking of the idea of having national centers that provide service for research centers in terms of hardware. So using open designs, keeping an inventory of what uh, research capacity is in the region or in the country, and using open designs to customize them and make them useful for the local context, but also training the, the technicians, training the researchers on how to work with these devices. So you can have a local circuit, which is something we are missing today. And finally, what I was mentioning about the platforming systems. So if we have modular instruments that can act as PCS key enablers that people can go and contribute to and take what they need and contribute what they want to, we may be getting to a place where we're almost setting an open standard for instrumentation, but it's open. So this is part of some research I'm, I'm doing now. What do we need to take those designs to the stage where we involve not only academics, but we involve those manufacturers that can improve um, performance and provide engineering knowledge and provide other kind of knowledge that scientists do not need. And honestly, they do, do not want to, often do not want to do all that work. So in which way can we foster those platform ecosystems to come up? So yeah, um, I think, I, think I, I mentioned everything I wanted to mention, but basically I want to give the idea of how it is important for research. We often don't pay attention to it. Um, and it's because we don't understand how it's broken already, how, how it affects our research already. Um, how we can, I, I think open hardware is a good strategy for, for strengthening research capacity, not only in the South. It's only always like the discourse of poor countries in the global South. Yeah, there, there's a space for that, but there's also space for strengthening research capacity here, right, in different institutions and, and the way we think of research. And finally, what can policy support? Uh, do for open hardware for research. I think if we bridge it with open science policy, we can harness the, the momentum and go forward. So yeah, my final question would be, if this happened, which new knowledge would be, would be available for us? And basically which problems we could tackle differently? So yeah, that's a, that's a picture of us in the last Open Flexure conference with some of the people from that map, from the pink map. And thank you for listening.